My name is Alex Wade. I am with Microsoft Research. And one of the things that we thought it would be good to do, um, in addition to the, the updates that you've been hearing and a lot of the, the efforts and outreach and, and wonderful activities that are going on in this space, is to turn our attention a little bit more toward the future uh, and ambitions and uh, what was it that Karen said this morning? Everybody knows the big dream. Everybody knows the golden vision. I, I wish she had should talk a little bit more about that, because I'm not sure everybody does know uh, these things. A thought experiment uh, that I think has been useful, uh, we've used at times in the past where I work, is it's sometimes difficult to think about what the future state is that you want to get to. Or even if you can imagine the future state that you want to get to, it's difficult to imagine the path to getting there. Uh, we tend to focus as humans on all of the obstacles that are in our way. And so it's hard to say how we traverse a course through all of those obstacles. The thought experiment uh, that is sometimes useful here is to imagine that the future has already arrived. Imagine that you've made it to, to that, uh, that big dream, that golden vision, uh, and then think backwards and think about what the path was for how you got here. Because as humans, uh, our brains are much more finely attuned to uh, coming up with explanations for why something has happened rather than sort of charting a course through an, an unknown uh, minefield. Uh, so with that, the, the three panelists that we have today are going to talk a little bit about uh, the future, about where, uh, where we are going to be in, I don't think we put a, a number of years, but at some state in the future. And uh, I'll sort of leave it all to you uh, to come up with good uh, questions for the second part of this after they've given their, their parts and, and ask probing questions about uh, how did we get to that golden future. So uh, the first speaker today is uh, from Tidewater Community College, uh, Daniel DeMart. Good afternoon. You guys awake? Yeah, yeah. yeah, good. So I'm going to share with you the short story of how the first OER-based degree in the United States came together, and then, uh, and then end with some notion of where I see this going from Tidewater's perspective and perhaps nationally. Before I do that, let me start with a little bit of background on Tidewater. How many in the room are from a community college? Okay, good. I was afraid I was alone, I'm not. <laughs> Tidewater is uh, headquartered in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, what you're looking at is one of our brag sheets. We are the 11th largest public two-year college in the US, uh, number 14 on the list nationally for the number of degree graduates that we produce. Um, we also have uh, uh, more military students post 9-11 GI benefit than any other college in the United States. In fact, Norfolk is home to the largest naval presence in the world, and at any given time, our student body consists of about a third, uh, about a third of them are, are military. And of course, uh, somewhere hidden on this brag sheet uh, is our, uh, our OER-based degree. Now, how many of you are fans of Alice in Wonderland? Yeah, good. One of my favorite quotes, sometimes I believe in as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Yes, in many ways, uh, that quote is symbolic of uh, this pioneering effort that we have been on to create what we now call the Z degree. And here's how that started. In August of 2012, I sat in an OER panel discussion, first time discussion I'd ever heard about OER. Uh, David Wiley was on the panel, Nicole Allen was on the same panel. We sat for an hour, we heard about OER, and at the end of it, David made this very casual remark. He said that it was possible that a college could create an entire degree with OER, but nobody had done it. I'm thinking, well, if it's possible, how come nobody's done this? Or is it impossible? And that's what most people think. Well, afterwards, I walked up to Dave and I asked him if it was really true. Was he pulling my leg? Was it really possible? And he said, in fact, it was. And I asked him at that point if he would be willing to work with Tidewater to help make this impossible thing possible. And David's response, along with everyone else who I've encountered in accomplishing what we have, the immediate response every time has been yes. So August of 2012, I hear this thing is possible, but nobody has done it. 
Six months later, we were getting underway. And, um, you know, part of the context and motivation behind it was this image. It, I can see it on the back of my eyelids when I close my eyes. That's how much I've seen this thing. And I imagine you've seen it too. There are variations on this. It hasn't changed. It, it makes the point very clear that the cost of textbooks, in this case, have outpaced the cost of uh, edu uh, medical services, new home prices, the consumer price index, and if I could add it on here, would also show my retirement. Again, it makes the point. Same month we started, January of 2013, same month we started to build our OER degree, this story appears in the Chronicle. I don't know if you remember this. This is an image, if you will, of what it looks like inside a college student's head when it's time to make a decision on purchasing a textbook. And I know you can't read it, but it says things on it like, first thing you do is you check ratemyprofessor.com and whether or not the professor uses the book. If they don't, you're good to go. If they do, you go to the next step. Well, can I find it for free somewhere on the web? If I can't, can I pirate it? There are actually sites where they can pirate some of these materials, right? If I, if I can't find it there, you know, it, can I buy it internationally? Can I find it on Amazon.com? Can I find it on Craigslist? But all through this, there are yes and no responses, and too many of our students end up with the no response, I can't buy the book. And nobody knows that story better than our faculty, who hear every day about the student who has to choose between buying gas or the book, gas to get to school, or can I buy all of my books this semester when I have to buy braces for my daughter? You name it. Students who continue in the course and don't do as well because they don't have the book, or the student who couldn't get the book until the fourth week in the semester because that's when their financial aid check posted to their account. Right? You hear these stories. Well, <clears throat> at Tidewater, I'm not that unique. We've had other options. In fact, in 2011, we introduced rentals through our bookstore provider, who's Barnes & Noble. At the same time, we introduced ebooks. You know, this is not Tidewater data. I'm just showing you what some of the other options are. So 2011, we introduced at Tidewater ebooks and rentals. Rentals right now at Tidewater are about 60, or we're at a 60% level. 60% of our titles are available by rent. At the same time, when we introduced those e-text, 1%. It's been flat at 1% ever since. And so we've done something, at least with rentals, to help drive that cost down, but we know that that is not the answer. The better answer is what we have done in creating what we are calling, or have called now for two years, our Z degree. For Tidewater, that is our Associate Science degree in Business Administration. It was redesigned at the course outcomes for each course it was redesigned from that level up, matching OER to each outcome in each course. Our entire business degree is offered in this mode. We also offer it the way we always have, but we now have this option where a student does not need to spend a dime on a textbook for the entire degree. In terms of faculty motivation, I mentioned that no one knows better what our faculty encounter in the classroom. And one of the reasons why we were able to move quickly in less than nine months creating our OER degree is because our faculty deal with this issue. They do not like the cost of textbooks. The motivation for them was already there. They heard this OER option and, and automatically said, we need to figure out how to do this. We put a team of 13 faculty together, put them in a room, and in nine months, they created it. So you can imagine, there was a lot of excitement around the message to our students that the cost of textbooks, if they chose, would no longer be a barrier to them getting in and staying in. Uh, there was also reassurance from the leadership, primarily me and our president, that there was support for this. And I'll touch more on that in a moment. And then uh, early on, these were not issues at Tidewater, although we spoke about them, about the quality of OER and academic freedom. In terms of quality, 
the standard that we set for ourselves and the faculty set the standard, they would select the OER. The OER that they selected had to be as good as or better than the textbook materials that they were using, and that was their call. With help, with the help of Lumen Learning, they found the content, matched it up to those outcomes, and, and rebuilt the courses. What you see above the line is what we addressed going into a two-year pilot. We are now a semester or two out of the pilot. What you, what you see below the line is what we're now learning beyond the pilot in terms of expanding what we have done beyond just a single degree. And so one of the things we're noticing, and you'll see this in the data, is that there is a definite improvement in the way that we've designed our Z courses, our OER-based courses, compared to any other design we have in any of our courses by matching that OER to the outcome. One reason why is it changes the conversa conversation. We're not talking about the book anymore. We're talking about course outcomes and the best resource to teach it. More engaged students. I don't know how many faculty who are teaching Z courses for us now will tell you, to a person, their students come in the course and they're ready on day one. Not day two, not three weeks into it. On the first day of class, they have what they need to be successful in that class. And so because of that, our students hit the ground running. Instruction on demand. You know, with these OER courses, all of our content for our courses reside in our LMS. Faculty can make changes as they go through the course. And one thing you'll hear faculty say repeatedly is the practice of teaching chapter seven, because it's between chapters six and eight, is irrelevant with the use of OER in the way that we've designed things. The filler is, is gone. These are lean courses that are, that are designed in a way where the content is driving, achieving the outcome. And of course, we have collaboration among faculty. Interesting story there. When we launched our effort, we had a handful of sections on each campus, and not all the sections that, that were required for the entire degree. We were seeing students enrolling in, a, in an accounting course, for example, that was a non-Z option, and they heard about the Z option where they didn't have to buy the book, they were leaving, withdrawing from a course on another campus to get in the one that didn't require the book. And some of that still continues. Uh, very much, uh, it is very much the case for us that demand, student demand, is, is driving where we go, how far we go uh, with the use of OER. And then cross-functional collaboration, that note is specifically about support outside the classroom that it takes in terms of capacity to sustain what we have done with this OER degree. Impact on students. We look at uh, the typical metrics uh, in terms of uh, you know, student experience in a Z course. Uh, this slide shows and we ask students, would they enroll in another Z course uh, uh, in comparison to other courses they have taken that are traditional? 85% of them say yes they would take another Z course. And in fact, many of them are. In terms of the course itself and the content uh, quality, is it as good as an OER-based course, as good as their traditional course with a textbook? 98% say at least the same or better. And then moving on to effectiveness, 85% say it's as effective or better the OER design versus the traditional design. We stopped asking these questions because the results come back the same every time we ask. And it's not just the case at Tidewater that we're getting these results, they are also true nationally. All right, retention. In terms of retention, at the point at which a student can drop a course without penalty, slightly fewer students are dropping Z courses compared to the non-Z courses. Similar story with withdrawals. F slightly fewer students are dropping out of Z courses compared to their, their counterpart non-Z courses. What's interesting is the number that's hidden in here. And we didn't realize this until we continued to pull the data. This also shows that more students are getting to the finish line if they're not withdrawing which also means that we're not refunding that tuition, right? The students are staying with us. And that has an impact on the financial viability of this model as we move forward. Uh, 
student success, uh, meaning a grade of, a, of C or better in, in the course, slightly higher in the Z courses compared to the non-Z courses, in this metric in particular, is beginning to widen. This data takes us through our pilot. We've been out of pilot for two semesters. The success rate is, is inching up, moving away from the traditional non-Z courses. We have some faculty who've been teaching for us for a long, a long time, uh, teaching Z courses that have been involved uh, from day one. They've had upwards of 35 students in a course in a couple of semesters now where not a single student dropped or withdrew. Unheard of in their years of teaching. And part of that is because of the design of the course and the use of OER. Savings. Financial savings to the student. We use a very conservative number. You know the number, $100 per book. And so that line shows uh, that in, up to the point where we ended the pilot, we had about 2,500 students who completed a Z course. Collectively, they saved a quarter of a million dollars. That line and above it is two years worth of activity. For, below the line is the one year coming out. So two years in pilot mode, 2,500 students. The first year coming out, we will double that number. We will have over 5,000 students first year out of the pilot that will have completed a Z course. And that impact continues. And you can also see how many sections of each course, uh, how many sections of the courses we're, we're completing. And this only reports uh, completers. This does not include uh, students who have withdrawn or dropped, but the numbers are tiny anyway. Lumen Learning, I think you've heard of Lumen. Lumen, early on in the pilot, uh, created this visual for us to show in the aggregate what the typical student would save if they completed their entire degree in the Z course mode and in effect completed a Z course, about 25%. One of our calculations is if a student bought every book new in each of the courses, that bill would be just under $4,000. And they don't need to spend a dime of that if they choose the Z degree. What's next? Uh, there's a lot next. We uh, have been involved in a system-wide effort funded by Hewlett. There are 16 colleges in Virginia that are replicating what we have already done at Tidewater. Uh, we've, uh, we've been approached by a number of universities, University of Mississippi, uh, University of Maryland. Uh, several others have come to Tidewater to learn more about what we've done and get some notion of how they may get started and, and get, put themselves on this path. We are also expanding. Uh, we're in the process right now. Tidewater will launch four additional Z degrees before the end of this calendar year. Uh, our social science degree, our general studies degree, and our applied degree in criminal justice. Those degrees collectively with the business degree represent 60 to 70% of our enrollments and probably about half of our graduations. And so this will continue to expand at Tidewater. Last week, uh, you, you may be aware of this, Achieving the Dream made an announcement, I think it was a week ago today. Uh, a group of foundations have come together. They are going to replicate, replicate the OER-based degree that was initiated in Virginia at Tidewater and Northern they're going to fund 20 to 30 of these nationally at $100,000 a piece. So the future is bright, um, at least from where, I, from where I'm sitting. And here's what I want to end with, um, actually two things. You know, I'm often asked about the financial model. How do you fund this thing? You know, at one point at the end of the first year of our pilot, we asked our financial aid office, could you show us what do students spend on textbooks? This is just textbook data. We looked at a full academic year. So you're looking at the aggregate of summer 2013, fall 2013, and spring 2014. In one academic year, students spent just under $12 million on textbooks. Of that amount, 60% of that was paid for through financial aid dollars, whether that was federal financial aid or student loan monies. 
Now you think about this. This is one college, one academic year. What would be the impact of replicating this 20 to 30 times across the US? Enormous. And here's the final note I want to leave you with, getting back to Alice in Wonderland. I too sometimes wake up and dream of six impossible things before I have breakfast. This OER degree was one of them. And I keep thinking about OER. What other impossible things are there that we can make happen with OER? What if every public institution in the US, and I'm talking high schools, colleges, and universities, offered at least one OER-based program? Imagine the impact. We're on this national agenda to increase completion rates. We see our completion rates going up, and that gap is widening. If we replicated this across all public institutions, imagine the impact we might have on completion rates. That should have said 500%, not 50. I'll fix that for the next audience. Federal student aid savings, 12 million one institution. Remember, a large portion of that is taxpayer dollars. We're talking about free education. This would help fund, if that's truly what we want to do, the savings from OER could help fund an initiative like that. May not be the answer, but it, it could be part of the answer. And what if we base, and I heard some of this earlier in the early panel discussion, what if we base tenure at Research One, Two, and Three institutions in part on not just the creation of OER, how about the use of OER? How about handing that off to a community college and having us put it in our programs and use it and demonstrate the use of that? How about basing tenure on that? And then if I were to add six, I'm sorry I missed that last slide, I would ask you, what two would you add? Anybody? I know you all dream impossible things. Somebody have something they would add to this list? This is what happens when I go after lunch, huh? Yes, ma'am. Don't leave private institutions? Okay, good. Anybody want to add any others? International? Yeah, I'm looking internally here, but international, good? Yep. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, second speaker today is from the Center of Open Science and Jeff Spees. Jeff? All right. Uh, I am Jeff Spees. I'm the co-founder and, and chief technology officer of the Center for Open Science. I'm the co-lead of the, thank you, April. I'm the co-lead of the SHARE project. Uh, and uh, a visiting scholar at the University of Virginia in the Department of Engineering and Society. So thinking about this, this vision, this future, and the path that takes us there, what I want to do is present some values I think that we need to sort of uh, uh, think about in greater detail. And I think we've all thought about these things, so I, I feel a little bit like I'm going to be preaching to the choir, um, but uh, that's, that's how I frame this. Uh, and I, I, will, I will provide at least the path that I think uh, that the center feels is, is a way forward. And by the way, it really is an honor to be speaking uh, in front of you today on this panel. Um, this has been a fantastic conference. Uh, I am consistently inspired by talking to people, hearing the, hearing the talks, talking to people in the, in, uh, well, that are now currently in the audience. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, uh, one uh, particularly inspiring moment uh, has been from the Spark team. Uh, if you know me, uh, this is a little more formal than typical. Um, but uh, they dress very well, as you can tell. Uh, uh, so I, I didn't go with my startup formal, which is typically my COS shirt, a jacket, and my nicest pair of blue jeans, and decided to go slacks and, and button down. So uh, it, it is inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. But really, the thanks is to you. Uh, 
but and for the open stuff. That's that's great too. Uh, okay, so Center for Open Science. Uh, we're a nonprofit tech company in Charlottesville, Charlottesville, Virginia. I've moved on from saying startup to tech company. We're, we're too big to call ourselves a startup now. I think uh, uh, we our mission is to increase openness, integrity, and reproducibility in the sciences. Um, we've raised just over $25 million since 2013. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more, but as I do that, I'll intru introduce you to the team uh, that we have at the center. And this is why I think we're past startup mode. Um, we are at full -time, uh, 40 full-time staff, uh, 24 interns. Um, we have a great paid internship program. We make very good use, uh, and I like to think we provide good value uh, to our undergrads and graduate student interns at the center. Um, they, they do a lot for us. Um, about three quarters of our staff are technical. Um, most are working on our flagship product, the Open Science Framework and its related services. Everything we do is free and open source. There is no monetization strategy behind any of the work that, that we're doing. One of the early missteps I think might have been uh, in our name. Uh, we went with Center for Open Science, the Open Science Framework. It probably would have been better to say Center for Open Scholarship, the Open Scholarship Framework. Uh, we see these two things as being so similar uh, that uh, we're lucky to have cos.io as our domain name, osf.io as our domain name. I think we'll be able to just switch that in the future. So think about scholarship. If I say science, think about scholarship. And really, the openness piece, uh, we appreciate openness. The open ideals are, are fantastic. But there's a broader goal, and that broader goal is research efficiency. We simply believe that openness is the mechanism to achieve greater efficiency in research. But that is the, the greater goal here. And I think, again, uh, you know this. Openness is the solution to some of the problems that we face. I think that the problems can be summarized as the gap between scholarly values and practices. So what I want to do as a, as a scientist, as a scholar, I believe in science, uh, we're in academia, uh, probably taking a pay cut because we believe in the values of scholarship. But in our day-to-day -day practice, um, that's not necessarily uh, what we do. And this comes from a skewed incentive system that we have. Currently, incentives for individual success are focused on getting it published, not on getting it right. Published does not mean accurate, and this is a big problem. Publishers want novel, positive uh, results. They want clean stories. They want confirmatory, successful narratives. But this really is not how science and scholarship work. In fact, it's a little arrogant to think that, it, that, that we can sell our, our work as being so clean. This is hard stuff. This is challenging stuff. This is why we're doing this. <laughs> One of the best representations of this that I've seen, how, the, how these incentives influence us on a day-to-day -day basis in very subtle ways comes from uh, this Anderson uh, uh, et al. study in 2007. Are people familiar with this? So what they did was wait, they asked a number of uh, scientists uh, what values they subscribe to. So whether that's norms like uh, open sharing as compared to counter norms like being closed evaluating research on its own merit rather than by reputation, being motivated by knowledge and discovery rather than competition, considering all evidence, no matter what your beliefs are, versus trying to confirm your own hypotheses, and then going for quality rather than quantity. And what we, what we saw in this survey makes, makes sense. The, the light gray bars are those, those people who subscribe to more norms than counter norms. The hash bars are those people that subscribe to an equal number of norms and counter norms. And the dark bars are people that subscribe to more counter norms than norms. And what we see are people, people are idealists. They subscribe to these values. But then you ask them what they do in day-to-day -day practice, their own behavior. And this shifts a little bit. And it makes sense. We care about our professional success. We care about our, our uh, personal uh, gains. And then the really 
uh, uh, troubling thing. The, this is where it, it really, you can see why we're, we have some of the issues we do. We ask them what their peers do. <laughs> I mean, they think they lie, cheat, steal, commit fraud. They, they do not have much respect for what their colleagues are doing. Uh, but if you're in a competitive environment, if you're trying to get tenure, if you're trying to get funding, if you're trying to get published, what do you do? Sometimes you will make explicit steps where maybe the counter norms are a little more uh, uh, valued. Or maybe it's subtle things, automatic things, things that come from our perception, our motivations, our biases that makes us lean towards those counter norms and we don't even know it. So I think one thing that we need to accept is that we all are humans. And these are very common attributes of humans. And so when you have these incentives at play, the behaviors can change. And that's not because someone's bad or evil. It's because they're human. But one value of openness is that it increases accountability. Even if no one sees the work, you're accountable to yourself. And so this is not about policing. This is just sharing. This is knowing that someone could look at it. Here's a study. Examining a problem, uh, the question being posed was, uh, do referees hand more red cards to dark-skinned players than light-skinned players in soccer? Football. So they asked 29 statisticians to do this analysis. And what they found uh, were, were answers from, it's equally likely, there's no bias, to it's t people are twice as likely if you're dark-skinned rather than light-skinned to get a red card. Even two outliers here, three times as likely. And these are good statisticians making s typical smart decisions along the way. And this speaks to how hard science is, how hard s statistics are. There's many decisions that are made in, in, the, in the scientific process. There's many paths you can go down. And again, those perceptions, those motivations, those biases can influence us, influence us in subtle ways that lead to different answers. That may lead us away from our values. And again, no one's evil here. They're just doing what they think is right. But again, this is where openness can help. Clinical trials, uh, uh, they looked at how many clinical trials had positive results before pre-registration and after pre-registration. So pre-registration being uh, snapshotting your hypotheses, saying this is what I believe will happen, then collecting the data, analyzing the data, and then seeing if that is, has been confirmed. And what they found uh, is uh, staggering, uh, from 57% positive results to 8%. Do you want your family, do you, do you want to be in a clinical trial where this is, that it was not pre-registered? There was a, a, a funny comment on, on Twitter uh, saying that uh, um, pre-registration caused medicines to be, uh, to, to not work. <laughs> I think we might have a different explanation. One thing COS is doing is promoting this idea of pre-registration. We have a pre-registration challenge. We're giving away a million dollars, a thousand dollars to a thousand researchers to pre-register their work, to just simply state what is confirmatory versus what is exploratory. We're pushing a, a, an idea called registered reports. This is the typical publication process. Peer review happens here. We can remove publication bias, at least most of it, if we just shift that. So you're peer reviewed on your design on the beauty of your methods, regardless of what your results are. So you are not incentivized to get a certain result, you're incentivized to have beautiful methods, to solve the problem in an, in, in an elegant way. This is very, very powerful. This is, this is an interesting one uh, that speaks to the power of gamification. Uh, these are badges, open data, open materials, pre-registered. Uh, uh, these are signals about your behaviors. So psych science adopted these badges and, and, and authors can, uh, uh, when they, when they uh, submit their manuscript, apply to, to receive a badge. 
And what, we see, what we've seen is a tenfold increase in data sharing since Psych Science has adopted the Open Data Badge from 2013 to 2015. A badge, an image on a publication. The publishers couldn't even link it to the data. You can't even click the badge. This is just a, a, some pixels on the publication. More so, thinking about that accountability, those people that got the badge versus those that didn't or those that were published in journals that didn't have badges, comparative journals, those people that received, that, that claimed in their, in their papers to have badges, the ones that got the badge are on that top blue line. If, when you looked at the data, it actually was available. That's the first dot to the, to the right. A little decrease, but it was mostly correct. A little decrease, you know, the usability was questionable. Uh, but, uh, and then looking at how complete it was, it was complete. But look at that in comparison and not getting that badge. This is accountability. All right, openness facilitates reproducibility. One of the, our big efforts has been the, the reproduce, reproducibility project psychology, reproducibility project cancer biology. Uh, the psychology um, study uh, looked at 100 studies and we just tried to replicate those. Um, this was published in Science in uh, August of 2015. You can find all of the data materials uh, on, on the OSF. This was a big project, 270 authors, 86 volunteers, um, 100 studies. One thing about this, this altmetrics view of, of, of this paper, out of altmetrics indexed 4.8 million articles, a paper about reproducibility, which by and large, no one cares about, is number 46 out of 4.8 million articles. Out of outputs from science, one of the top journals in, our, in, 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 in science, uh, it's number two out of 37,000 indexed articles. So I think this speaks to some of the progress we're making about bringing this into conversation. But let's look at the results. What we found, again, that publication bias, 97% of those 100 studies had positive results. Upon replication, 37% had positive results. And that's not to say that the initial was, that was wrong. There are many reasons uh, why uh, uh, the replication could be wrong. Uh, maybe there's some variables that weren't taken into account. But this is, this is hinting at some, some issues. And compared with all of this other evidence, we, we do have these challenges. So Michael Inslicht wrote a, a, a beautiful piece recently, and I think we need to see more of this, talking about this problem. I'm going to read you, I don't typically do this, but I, I, was going to, I would read you the whole blog if I could. I'll read you a little bit of this. Okay, this is a, a, a well-known psychologist um, making a statement uh, about reproducibility. As someone who has been doing research for nearly 20 years, I now can't help but wonder if the topics I chose to study are in fact real and robust. Have I been chasing puffs of smoke for all these years? I've spent nearly a decade working on the concept of ego depletion including work that is critical of the model used to explain the phenomenon. I have been rewarded for this work, and I am convinced that the main reason I get any invitations to speak at colloquia and brown bags these days is because of this work. The problem is that ego depletion might not even be a thing. By now, many people are aware that a massive replication attempt of the basic ego depletion effect involving over 2,000 participants found nothing, not a zip. Only three of the 24 participating labs found a significant effect, but even then, one of these found a significant result in the wrong direction. We are left with a sobering question. If a large sample pre-registered study found absolutely nothing, how has the ego depletion effect been replicated and extended hundreds and hundreds of times? More sobering still, what other phenomena, which we now consider obviously real and true, will be revealed to be just as fragile? You should read the whole blog. This is heartbreaking. 20 years of research. This is a very negative piece, but a beautiful piece. He's taking, he's, he's taking that accountability. The registered report that he mentioned was one of those registered reports that in psych science. The data you can see on the OSF.
you really should read this blog. This, this is what we need to be admitting. This is what we're facing in scholarship right now. But a lot of times there's a defensive reaction to replication. And I understand that. I think I would be defensive too. My initial reaction would almost certainly be defensive. You're questioning someone's life work. That, that you would be defensive about that. And the problem is that, it come, that that feedback comes too late. Feedback in scholarship can only happen when it means a retraction. It cannot be collaborative. A replication cannot be an extension in collaboration. It is a competitive statement. And this is one of the problems, but this is one of the values that openness provides. And it's crucial to solving the big problems that we face. The Human Genome Project, one of the uh, 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 most significant probably in our time, claims two principles at the, at, the, at the root of their success. Data was released within 24 hours, and anyone could, co could contribute to that project. And this speaks to something we've heard a lot about. Openness is inclusivity. I think other speakers have said it much better than I could, so I'll, I'll just leave that. Um, further, openness fosters innovation. There are domains that we cannot innovate in right now. For example, literature discovery. This is metadata, uh, indexing of, of publications. There are only a few groups that, that can actually develop tools for literature discovery. There are publishers or people that license from publishers. This means that there's no dissertations, there's no master's theses, there's no small businesses starting up in this, in this domain. This is metadata, this isn't even the raw, raw text. SHARE is, is an attempt to help deal with this problem by creating a free open data set of scholarly research activity. We want to make this available for people to create tools on, to do meta-scholarship. This is an interesting one. We can't even apply our own scholarly methods to our work to find out how efficient we are because we don't have the data. We can't access the data. You have people at your own institutions that could be answering problems for you, but you don't have the data. You have to buy your data back to actually do that. And they'll, you have to probably buy that service. You can't do that yourself. Uh, one thing you may be interested in, uh, we just started a SHARE Curation Associates program. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a really neat step forward with SHARE, um, allowing people to uh, learn to use this data set to contribute back to their own uh, institution. So openness is more than open data, open access, and open education. We know why this content is important. It has to do with accountability, reproducibility, collaboration, innovation, and inclusivity. But we do need more. When we're giving away our data, data whatever that is, that's source code, that's actual data, that's uh, uh, metadata, um, this is administration, administrative information, anytime we're giving away data, openness needs to be open sourced. I was at Cindy recently um, talking about public access infrastructure. And Ed Van Gamert, uh, a director of libraries uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, one of the largest research institutions, uh, said the following. I can't afford to buy back data. We can't repeat the same model that we have with text. This is a large institution saying this. And it sounds very similar to an adage, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. But this isn't our past, this is our current. We, we can see the problems, we know the problems. Everybody in this room knows what the problems are. Yet we are doing things that are going to force us to repeat this with everything other than, than text. All of that data, whatever that is, we are going to repeat, re repeat this, this history. And this has to do by, by giving away our our, our work, our data, to proprietary solutions. And this is where openness comes in again. Openness protects against lock-in, vendor lock-in, also known as proprietary lock-in or customer lock-in from Wikipedia. In economics, vendor lock-in makes a customer dependent on a vendor for products and services, unable to use another vendor without substantial switching costs. These are, these are businesses. Groups that are doing very good things for openness have exit strategies of selling to publishers, and they will say those things. They're not going to build APIs. Some of them explicitly say, we're not going to build APIs. We're not going to allow you to export 
your data from our service. Or if they do, it's in a proprietary format, in an obfuscated format. Their, their terms of service are incredibly limiting, especially for programmatic access. And this is dangerous if we're trying not to repeat history. And I think we deserve a different business model here. And again, these services are not evil. This is their goals. This is their motivation. Their values are to, to in, in, in the end, create a sustainable uh, infrastructure uh, and make money. But those values are different than scholarships values. They're not necessarily aligned. But we have an option. We could repeat a different history. This is the history of open source software. We know that we can, we can achieve sustainability with open source models. We have many, many success stories. People think it's a, it's a business risk. It's a risk to sustainability. But we have all these demonstrations. One that I like to point to is that scaling is hard. If you're currently successful, you've scaled. We, I know this now. We're moving past that, you know, the 40 number to 50 to 100. Scaling is very, very challenging. It takes a lot of work to scale. Someone's just not going to take that, that code base and start a business and be competitive. It just can't happen. And if they can scale that rapidly, they could probably recreate the code pretty easily. The open source movement is showing signs that this idea of, of having, uh, protecting oneself via non-commercial agreements um, is, is, is moving away. Since 2009, 